What's up? El Copeland here from Rising Tide. Happy to see you again. Uh, welcome back to the care and feeding of meat computers. This is part three. Um, today we're going to talk about how humans are like computers. So when we last left off, I had you ask the question, if your network is worth uh, $2 million a person or $10 million a person, however you want to do that math, however you value the people in your life, which I hope is uh, substantially, what is the value? What's the insurable value of the people in your care? Um, and so, so with that in mind, we're just going to jump right in. If we are surmising that the people in our care are worthy investments and in highly valuable pieces of technology, how can we look at them? How can we look at humans as that technology and not just as frustrating creatures that we have to figure out and mind read about? So, um, so what we're gonna do is we are going to talk a little bit about how humans are like computers. So how are those people closest to you like computers? Let's imagine, what that looks like. So uh, the first bit of a computer, we'll start at the very basics. Um, a computer is zeros and ones, right? That are the very heart of, uh, of a computer. It is hardware. And so I want you to just imagine with me that, you know, a blob of matter with electrical impulses that's that's a human. That's that's the hardware that we're dealing with. We are uh, a, a blob of um, uh, of electrical impulses, and these are you know genetics. It's nature and nurture. It's um, it's what we were given to work with. It's the geography. It's uh, the weather where we where we were born. If we were born by the water, it's um, it's the DNA that we inherited. Like I'm part Asian, so I'm not very tall, but my biomechanics make me very good at weightlifting. I'm <laughs> there's certain things that I'm gonna be genetically predisposed to: illnesses, injuries, all of these things. Humans are just hardware. So you just consider it's skills and abilities that are limited by the physical housing. That's shape, that's size, that's biomechanics, the way that your bones lay, the way that your muscles maybe grow faster or not as fast as other people. If you can see, I wear glasses, I'm very blind. Some people don't have to deal with that ever. But those are, those are experiences that some people have. So this is hardware. Um, <laughs> as hardware, Humans, you want to make sure that you have them in locations that don't put them in harm's way. There's actually studies that say heart health is better for communities that have green space near them. Um, so in the same way, you probably don't want to put uh, a, a server room in a, a basement that's prone to flooding or even right underneath a sprinkler system, which I've definitely seen. But, you know, even there's, there's, you don't want to put them in a place that's unsafe, you know, put things in a, in a, in a way that has them in harm's way. You want them to be able to, to operate to the best of their abilities. So humans are hardware. Uh, you probably don't want to put them in water and electricity. That's probably bad too. Along with that, humans being hardware, we require reliable energy sources and rhythm. Um, so for a computer, you need to make sure it's plugged in to work you need to turn it off and turn it on again every once in a while. And in the same way, humans do require food and, and physical activity, you know, make sure that you're, you're moving uh, a sleep cadence, you know, make sure you're sleeping. So all of these things are just to, to show you at the very, the very basics, the things that we inherit and how we engage in the world around us is pretty similar to a computer. You can open us up, pull us apart. There's tons of books about uh, how to wire a human. We don't know how to actually create life, but it is, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty funny if you think about just uh, what do we pull off the shelf? This is just what you got in this certain geographic area. That's all that's available to you. So if, uh, if humans are hardware, um, if they are uh, just a blob of meat with electrical impulses, 
what about the layers on top of that? What about our personalities, about our preferences, um, about uh, how we engage in the world itself? And so I would propose to you that humans are also impacted by their software experience, their operating systems. And so if you consider that your nature is what you're birthed with, your nurture is what's put on you. So is the software. It's, um, it's what is ingrained in us from an early age. Do you like dogs or cats? Do you like tacos or burgers? Do you like coffee or do you like tea? All of these things are results of our lived experiences about what happened to us as we go through the world. In fact, it was Jung, one of the fathers of modern psychology, who said that we are born a circle. And as we are disciplined as children, as we have experiences where people laugh at us, bits of us are cut off until we emerge as an adult, a sliver of who we once could have been. And that the rest of that follows us as our shadow self, the things that we are ashamed of or that we don't pursue and that our life is meant to be pursuing the incorporation or the reincorporation of the good parts of that shadow self. So, so what if nurture is our software that you consider a family? I've got three siblings, same hardware, <laughs> same, same two parents, same, uh, we all graduated from the same high school, but my, my two younger brothers have wildly different operating systems. My youngest brother, Jeff, I never, this kid has so much risk. Did I get that word right? Uh, these kids have, this guy has so much risk. I, I wouldn't know. My little brother, Chris, he's finishing up, he's finishing up his college career at Georgia Tech. Like he's such a smart guy. Like these kids are so smart. And like, maybe, maybe I could have experienced that or done that. But like my operating system, I was wired in a different way, even with the exact same hardware. So you have to consider that what works for certain people doesn't work for all people. And, 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 and transfers between those two operating systems are, are wildly in, inefficient. Um, I'm one of those people, since I've done some graphic design work in my life, I'm pretty familiar with the Mac ecosystem. And so as I've been using a PC in recent years, all of my short code cut keys are wrong. <laughs> They're all wrong. I'm always like reaching for the Apple logo and it's not one on the PC, right? So even, even your shortcuts, the things that work for you aren't going to work for other operating systems. And you have to be aware of that. That's just how it works. And then um, <laughs> I get into a lot of arguments anytime I mention this. And I don't know, maybe I'm just a pugnacious person and I just want to fight. So if you want to fight, let's fight. But I mean, you also have to consider that like you're the sum of what you've experienced. One of the things about free will to me is that you you cannot choose something that you don't know exists. And so if you consider that, that you only know the inputs that have been put on you, what does that mean for the decisions that you get to make throughout the rest of your life? And so humans are software. You've got your nature, what you were born with, what you were given, the physical housing, the location that you are. You've got your nurture, you've got the software. And then you've got what these things turn into in the community that you're in, and that is networking. So considering networking, humans are, uh, as, I, as I say here, we're hardwired for survival. We are constantly taking inputs. We're constantly processing. We're constantly vigilant. And we, we seek connection. We seek being a part of other people. One of the ways I've often heard the constant vigilance explained is um, that we have a lizard brain. We've got this back part, the amygdala, I think it's called. We have this back part of our brain that is that is is wired to keep us safe. And so we're constantly on the lookout for things that don't fit the patterns that we uh, expect. So we are we are highly functioning pattern seeking creatures. And so we are constantly taking inputs, constantly thinking, constantly listening, constantly connected to the world around us. And um, that part of our brain is processing those things to make sure that we're safe. And in fact, there's a theory that the reason there's been an uptick in people needing anxiety medications and stuff like that in our world these days 
is because we don't need that part of our brain anymore because we are relatively safe. Despite what the news wants to say, we have meals, we have um, uh, roofs over our heads, and um, we're, we're anxious because we don't have anywhere to put that energy that the back of our brain is constantly on alert for. And so with that, I already alluded to this previously, but I see MSPs, people in IT, IT service professionals constantly being heroes. And so I just, I'm always curious, you know, just ask yourself, do you, do you want to be a hero? What drives that desire? Where is that desire for connection coming from? I think it is just a part of humanity that we want to be connected. We want to matter. We want what we do to matter. We do want to create a legacy. We do want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. Um, can you trust your senses? I, uh, I'm sure you've, you've heard all of the talk about AI and um, about when you put in bad data to AI, it, all it can do is it's just, it's just fancy autocomplete, right? Like it's just connecting the dots and what you put in and what you perceive, those shape the outputs that are coming out. And so it's really, really important to consider that we're constantly taking in inputs and sometimes our inputs are faulty. Um, how many of you are familiar with uh, the dress? So a couple years ago, there was um, a dress on the internet. And uh, the question was, is it white and gold or is it blue and black? And um, I tell you what, as someone who works in graphics, this broke me because I understood it scientifically but when I saw it one way and I couldn't see the other way and my, my sister were like, oh no, I see it the other way. And we couldn't see the same thing at the same time. It's not that you can't trust reality, but um, some people just don't have the cones in their eyes to be able to differentiate things. That doesn't make them morally wrong. It's just, it's just a fact. Uh, it's just, it's just a pre-processing error. And uh, that's just how things are sometimes. And so you've got to be aware that um, in a network, in community, there are going to be times where not everyone has the same uh, uh, hardware and software. And as a result, there can be errors in processing. There's going to be errors in connections because you can't always trust exactly what you're seeing or what you're experiencing. And you are picking up signals all of the time that your brain is constantly filtering through. The last question or a thing to consider is you can't air gap a human, right? Like with a computer, you can just say, oh, you're offline, <laughs> you're done. Um, but with us constantly taking in inputs, noise, I've got a neighbor that's been working on a, 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 like a game room at the back of his house, like building it for a year and he's hammering literally every day. Uh, and it's, you know, like sometimes that drives me insane. Or maybe the person who was late to the office today, maybe the dog pooped in his shoes on the way out the door or his kid wouldn't get out of bed. Um, or, or, or she's late because she spilled coffee all over and had to turn around and go change. There's a ton of things that, that cause inefficiencies in our lives. And that's just a fact. You just going to be constantly in inputs, constantly experiencing things outside of your little, your little office or your little experience. And you've got to hold space for those problems being reality. So that's my, mainly what I wanted to talk about today is how humans are like uh, computers mainly when you talk about nature and nurture, hardware and software, when you talk about our connections with others, our connections to the network. Our next session, we are going to pick up with how do you take care of people? How do you take care of yourselves? What is the standard care and maintenance of a meat computer? 
So thanks again for joining me today on um, this session on the care and feeding of meat computers. Again, I'm Elle Copeland from Rising Tide, and I look forward to seeing you on the next one. See ya.